All right, good morning. Let's call this William Hilton Parkway Gateway Corridor Independent Review Advisory Committee meeting of December 12th to order. Yasmin, would you call the roll, please? Or, Perry? Or, are we in compliance with Yes, sir, we are. Thank you. Mayor hey, Perry? Here. Mr. Avocat? Back. Here. Mr. Young? Uh, next approval of minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. So moved. Uh, before we get going uh, with the presentation, um, I, I do want to change the the agenda a little bit. It's well, no, it, it is changed. I'm corrected on that. Um, let everybody know that that while every meeting is not video recorded. Um, it is audio recorded, and today this is going to be recorded through Teams, Microsoft Teams, and will be posted onto the website along with the project site as well. So if you want to go back and get, get information from previous meetings, you can you can FOIA the town and get a, the, re, the audio recording. So just want to let everybody know that that is out there. Um, <clears throat> unfinished business, presentation of initial findings of existing project reports. John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one and one reminder about the recording: we can make sure everyone speaks loud and clearly into the microphone. Uh, we'll make sure that our audio recording um, is uh, in a condition where people can understand what was being discussed, and then the teams meeting as well will um, will capture uh, this information. Um, I just want to remind um, everyone while we're here that we've executed a contract with Lock Miller to do an independent review. For the um, for the Gateway Corridor project um, on the Cross Island route down to Sea Pine Circle, on the business route down to Hooping Crane, and uh, to look at alternative assessment assumptions and traffic modeling and forecasting, um, and to, and to make some recommendations um, related to the project overall that is right for Hilton Head Island. Uh, we've asked Lock Mueller to be an, a true independent evaluator of the project, um, and and help drive the bus on what they believe from an engineering um, and uh, corridor planning team are, uh, are worthy recommendations uh, to bring forward. Um, they're going to go through some initial findings today. And then really uh, what's important is we get into the criteria to evaluate alternatives. They're going to give some, um, some guidance on how they believe to best narrow the, the alternatives down and um, ask the committee for input. Um, what we'd like to do is be able to take this from a very wide position down to a narrower position for evaluation to really do the in-depth modeling that needs to occur to understand performance, costs, um, and uh, capabilities and alternatives that should be considered further. So I just wanna put that out there at the beginning. Um, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Nate Norin and his team to walk through the items on the agenda. And then um, I have my team that didn't want to sit next to me today. Um, Brad McAwee, Jim Iwanaki, I want to say Brad Strader also on our team as a consultant is virtual on the screen. And I know um, Lock Mueller has a couple of members, um, Chad Costa and Sharif Ula um, on the screen virtually as well. And they will all participate in the meeting today. To the town, town. who came today, thank you for taking time. Last meeting, my name is Nate Norin. I'd like you to have uh, overseeing the technical completion of all, as well as Tyson King. He Travel demand model and Sharif's going to be. What we could do is just maybe start off and give you all just enough.
the connection is probably quite strong enough to try and share my screen, but um, essentially, eventually, sorry, thank you. Um, so everything's uh, been loaded into synchro modeling software, which is kind of our default signal system software. Um, and that is 100% uh, transferable to this product called WaySync. Um, so there's a desktop version that is on my machine right now. Uh, build the system there first, and then it is transferred by a cloud source to this iPad or any any mobile device, really. Uh, it's just an app that, that runs on the device. Um, and then this morning, we started our, our trial time runs with this uh, software running. Um, so it will actually record GPS locations throughout the corridor um, along with video from the dash. So um, this will be extremely helpful for our modelers when we get into the VISM phase of the project that they have a direct replication of how the actual travel went through the corridor, not just based on um, what the synchro models and the, the progression along uh, what those what the what those models show as long as far as progression. This is actual progression that was experienced on the corridor. So that's an important step when you have an adaptive system because it is changing. So what we have is the base uh, timing plans from uh, the controllers currently that changes obviously each big period. So we wanted to capture that with actual trials and runs that we can replicate uh, as we move further along the modeling process. We're able to have our first round of observations this morning. Uh, Kate and Tice will be in town um, through tomorrow and they'll be heading back to the Midwest on Thursday. And then we'll take that data that we've received and then share that with our, our VISIM staff and they can really use that to better calibrate all of our models to really emulate how things are working um, on the island. Hey, if I could jump in, just to, the importance here is the scope that was approved by the committee and by town council um, requested that we include the adaptive traffic signal project and the outcome and the data um, into the evaluation so that we had some confidence that based upon this new technology, if there was any impact to traffic operations, that it would be captured. And so um, what we're hearing now is that they're getting that information to be able to incorporate into um, the modeling capability and um, that we're making sure that we're um, doing exactly what the committee and council asked for from that standpoint. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, something else that was part of our scope was to do a um, in-depth analysis of the existing travel demand model. And uh, we've been able to uh, put forth a tremendous amount of effort in doing so. And Sharif, we have uh, him on the line. And Sharif, would you uh, like to go ahead and uh, share some of your preliminary findings? I have the PowerPoint slide. Um, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, good morning, everyone. So as Nate mentioned that as part of this project, uh, we also devoted some time to go through the existing LATS travel demand model, uh, the low county area transportation study, the local MPO model. So throughout this uh, review process, uh, we received like, you know, uh, a lot of cooperation from the MPO and we are very thankful to them. Uh, for providing the model uh, to us and also like in answering our questions. So what we found that the existing travel model, uh, it has a base year of 2019 and its horizon year is 2045. And when it was last updated uh, around the COVID period, uh, it was uh, pretty limited in scope as we got the information from the consultant and also from the MPO. And when we look at the horizon year population for uh, the Bedford County, uh, I'm sorry, the Beaufort County and Jasper counties, we see that uh, there is uh, approximately a difference of 60,000 population which was not included in the model. So uh, basically the long range transportation plan from the MPO, uh, it has a different total population uh, for these two counties and the model total population for the same horizon year 2045, uh, that's uh, less and the difference is approximately 60,000. And uh, the main reason is when it was updated, uh, it was, uh, as they mentioned, limited in scope. So uh, as it didn't consider uh, the full extent of the future development in terms of uh, the new 
socioeconomic information, the population, employment, and all that uh, throughout the two counties. Uh, so the projections we are going to receive uh, from this particular model will not be reflective of uh, what we can expect, uh, say like you know 20 years from now or 25 years from now. So that is why uh, we found that the model is not uh, the appropriate tool to uh, use for uh, identifying the growth rate on uh, uh, the William Hilton Parkway uh, bridge uh, as, as part of this project. If you could go to the next slide. And also, uh, we try to uh, review a few additional information in terms of like, you know, the traffic flow characteristics and how that is being influenced by uh, the economic activities and so on. So what we found that uh, the overall population within the Hilton Head Island actually didn't grow much uh, if you consider uh, census 2010 and census 2020 data. It only grew by uh, 2% uh, in a 10 year period. But for that same time period, if we look at uh, the traffic volume at the bridge, uh, that increased almost 16% from 2010 to 2021. And the main reason behind this is uh, there are lots of visitors. Uh, there are lots of workers coming to the island uh, to work, uh, to uh, visit, uh, uh, the, uh, say like, you know, uh, all the beaches and also like, you know, maybe coming for uh, the other attractors like the restaurants and all uh, all the traffic attractors there. So that's why uh, although the island population is not increasing, uh, you can see uh, the traffic volume at the bridge is uh, gradually increasing like, you know, uh, uh, the historically over the last 10 uh, or like, you know, 15 year time period. So at this time, um, if you could go to the next slide, Nate. So as we cannot be, uh, use the existing travel demand model for uh, the traffic growth rate at the bridge, uh, we are left with a few other options. So one option could be uh, to rebuild the travel demand model, which would be uh, significantly time consuming and also it would take a, a lot of time, as I said, like, you know, and resources. Uh, the other option could be uh, to develop a quick model for estimated traffic growth, uh, as this is a unique situation. So this is an island and also almost 65% of the workers of the island is coming from the mainland and you have significant number of seasonal population. Uh, so like, you know, who comes to the island, stay for probably a few days and then like, you know, leave. And also you have the daily visitors coming to the beaches or to the restaurants from the mainland. So we are uh, thinking of uh, developing a quick model based on uh, the historic traffic flow trend, uh, number of workers who are coming from the mainland, number of visitors which are coming uh, in the island. So uh, the way to uh, uh, or like you know quantify this would be uh, say like you know how many um, say like uh, uh, the rental facilities like, you know, uh, the Airbnb and others uh, you have, like, you know, the accommodation revenue you are collecting, uh, the restaurant tax revenue you are collecting. So all, all this information putting together, uh, we are trying to correlate traffic growth as part of this. And the last option could be utilizing the big data where uh, you could track like you know the cell phone data where people are moving uh, how they are spending time uh, how they are uh, like you know spending resources and so on uh, again like you know the big data would be uh, pretty costly and also like you know it will take some time to clean the data so we uh, are already working with the town uh, to get some information on uh, how many new developments were occurring like every year and then um, what is like you know the accommodation tax you were receiving, uh, the tax uh, like you know from the restaurants you were getting, the parking revenue you were collecting. So if we could get those information, we are confident that we can come up with a model uh, which would be uh, correlated with all these uh, independent variables together, and then we can identify how it is influencing uh, the traffic flow uh, at the bridge. So that's the update I have uh, for you. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions if you have.
Do you have any questions at this point from the committee? No. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sharif. Um, oh, thank you. Well, you know, if we have any more questions or if we circle back to that in later discussion. Um, so the other topic that I would like to bring up is trying to begin to narrow down the vast array of alternatives that are possible for this corridor. Um, I'd like to point out in the study process that we are not currently able to definitively identify, like we're not going to decide in this meeting which four exact alternatives we are going to go home and analyze. So we just want to talk in a high level about the different characteristics of certain types of alternatives. And I want to get a better understanding from you all what your deal breakers are, essentially. Uh, my understanding of your current viewpoint on a number of these items based on historic review, our time speaking in previous meetings, is that there are lots of things that are undesirable or maybe we don't want them in an alternative here. Uh, I'm going to list four different major themes and my current understanding of why uh, there may be some opposition to those and then we can move into further discussion on each of those individually as needed. So one of the ideas for a potential corridor alignment or alternative involves grade separation. And so what do I mean when I say grade separation? It's a bridge component, vertical separation between the roadway and some component. That could be what you traditionally see on an interstate as an interchange, or it could be only certain movements and not the entire intersection. So I believe some of the previous alternatives that you have analyzed included flyover ramps where one turning movement in particular would you know, be elevated in a bridge section, go up, come back down, and not have to go through a signal, so to speak, to, to complete the movement. So grade separated alternatives are one of the first things that we turn to consider in traffic analysis when you have a very congested corridor because it naturally takes out the conflict, the separated part of it reduces the conflict. However, it's my understanding that um, there, there may have been some opposition to those alternatives in the past because this is a, a beautiful island, a beautiful town. You may not want to impact the parkway feel that you currently have, or it may impede some views of the beautiful surrounding nature or waterways. Um, so that is you know, one, one topic I'd like to discuss. The second general kind of uh, characteristic for potential treatments would be alternative left turn treatment. And there are a lot of specifics into that, but generally it, uh, it includes having left turn vehicles pass their original point of turn and potentially do a U-turn to come back and make a right. There are also other alternatives where you cross the road ahead of where you normally would make the left turn and then make a left turn in about the same vicinity where you would today. So there are alternatives that have a lot of benefits but treat some minor movements with other ways of getting through the intersection than they do today in a traditional setting. And, you know, as I said, those have lots of benefits, but I understand from previous communications and discussion that there may not be uh, an appetite from the public for those movements if you are a left turning vehicle. The, the third point would be to uh, discuss taking additional right of way just in a very large context. I know that the environment is very important in this area. It's a very unique landscape. The right of way is, is very generous in portions of the corridor today, but a lot of these, or some of these alternatives, the footprint of them just naturally is a bit larger than what you currently have out there. I'd like to understand if there is an appetite for additional right of way acquisition along the corridor. If yes, is there, you know, a certain area where you'd be able to accept right away take, but not in other specific areas. You know, are there areas where we need to be more cognizant of the right of way, you know, on, on one portion of it, maybe next to the Stony community and other areas where we'd be we'd be able to accept perhaps a larger footprint than you have today. And the last topic I'd like to go over is access management, which means uh, you know, how or where people are allowed to 
kind of make a left out onto the corridor or a left from the corridor onto a side street. I think that there is pretty good access management along your corridor right now. Um, you know, there aren't very, there aren't too many closely spaced driveways that um, seem to be of concern, but some of these alternatives, uh, you know, could explore making some driveways that are today full access, meaning you can turn left in or out from any direction. Uh, you know, maybe they would go to be right in, right out, and vehicles would be asked to take a different path to get out and make a left or a different path to turn left in to access different parts of the corridor. Um, you know, access management does not mean cutting off completely. It just might mean rerouting a little bit. So it, there may be, uh, you know, some some opposition to some of these components, but in, in my professional opinion, we're going to need a combination of some or all of these along the corridor to come up with a solution that will reduce congestion. Um, quite frankly, there is not an alternative out there that does not include at least one of these four things that I mentioned and reduce your congestion. So if we're serious about improving the feel of the corridor and the mobility, allowing people to move through the island with less delay, um, you know, I need to understand which of these points you are okay with exploring further. So maybe let's move back to the top one, uh, you know, grade separation, any type of bridge alternative, and, um, you know, is there any strong opposition to that alternative? Or maybe, you know, I'd be fine with it at Spanish Wells, but not at Windmill Harbor. Um, any comments? I consider that a separate issue from these four points. This, you know, kind of take take the bridge. We'll deal with that later. Correct. No, that's not that's not off the table in total consideration. But these specific points are once you touch down on the island from the mainland, the roadway that's on the ground. How do we move forward with alternatives for that? And the bridge is a separate. You're actually looking at this in two, two, two stages. The, the bridge is one stage, is, and then all the rest of the roadway is a second. Yes, um, you know there are theoretically a number of different bridge configurations that we could butt up against to the island, and then the roadway configuration kind of pieces up next to it. So, um, so yes, the the bridge in in my mind for this discussion is has no impact on. The alternatives that we would propose for the rest of the corridor. So I'm talking from, um, yeah, from Windmill Harbor down onto the island. On that uh, option, one that she's discussing, you know, other comments, please. Uh, I had a question. <clears throat> so I appreciate you listing all these alternatives uh, and what is available. Um, what I am I'm hoping for, uh, maybe this meeting, maybe uh, the next meeting, is to actually put that in a simulation model. Because I think simulation models are so powerful and can really sh show if I if I don't allow left turns, if I do, if I have a uh, alternative, uh, how does that affect traffic flows uh, on different hours of the day? And you can also uh, model the traffic flows um, at various stages in the day. So I think that um, I was hoping that we could get to that stage. Um, uh, but that's that's one question. Yeah, I. Well, do you have more questions? You want me to address that one? Sorry. Do you have a further comment or question, or would you like me to address on that a different one? different topic? But okay, yeah. So we we are very anxious to get to the simulation modeling part of this as well. Our scope of work is to analyze four alternatives, and so as I see it, there are numerous grade separation options. I could analyze four different grade separation options for you, but that wouldn't even touch any of the other ones. So we have you know, probably 15, 16, 20 potentials that we could move forward with in a simulation analysis, as you're suggesting, but that would take 
a lot of time and a lot of money. And that's just not the reality of the calendar that we're up against or the fiscal constraints of the available funds for this study. So what I'm hoping to get from our discussion today is a feel for preferences of the or the town on which of these they would be agreeable to seeing as alternatives that go into that model. And we are definitely still a, you know, here to be an independent voice. And I am going to tell you my professional opinion throughout this entire process. But just because we are here as an independent reviewer doesn't mean that I want to do this in a vacuum. Or if I look at this without taking into context any of the local considerations or people that live here, then we potentially could come back with four alternatives. You don't like any of them. And then it's just, you know, us shoving an option down your throat that isn't going to be suitable for the long-term people that live here and the visitors on the island, or perhaps it's not in alignment with what your values really are. Perhaps you would rather not take any right of way along the corridor, protect the environment at all costs. And if that means we have to do a vertical bridge and some component, fine. Or if we all are very dead set on not having any vertical obstruction to the view surrounding us, then that might mean we have to go a little bit wider and you're okay with that. Fine, that's what I'm trying to understand. But <clears throat> I wanna throw this back at you because none of us here are traffic experts. Maybe one or two people are. And we are, I mean, you're saying, well, we wanna see uh, what, what the town thinks, what the committee thinks, but I, wanna, I want to know what you think. You are here because you're an independent entity looking at all these alternatives and trying to figure out what works. So um, I, I have put more value into what you come up with as new ideas and, and uh, alternatives and present that in various simulation models. Maybe we should even have a working meeting on simulation where we can see, because it takes time to, to, to look at all these alternatives. And I think uh, that's where there's value for everyone. There's, there's no value in for us to vent what we really want to do and what we really like and what we don't like, it's we are looking at you um, to come up with these new alternatives, really. Um, so, wait a minute. I mean, you've come up with four alternatives here. Uh, four, Aren't I, they going to be all looked at individually, or are you asking us for our favorite one? I mean, what what's the? So, this list is not intended to be alternatives. This was intended to be ideas that lend themselves to different alternatives. So, uh, you know, Dietrich, if we were to not take anybody else's opinion and go home and come back with alternatives that we think are our best for the corridor, we can certainly do that. And if that is the discussion today that no one would like to impart any thoughts or considerations for us to go back, that's exactly what we'll do. Then we will look at the numbers and come back and have an alternative where we feel that based on the, the numbers from the traffic, that that is what's gonna serve best for the community. Um, these, this list here of the characteristics for some of these alternatives, um, you know, I, I wanted to, in a collaborative effort, give this committee, the town, the chance to input their preferences, thoughts, feelings. Um, you know, I really, really, really don't like that because there's not just gonna be one option that will work for this area. If there is option A and option B that both function fine from a traffic perspective, but one of them involves a bridge that will impact the views and one of them takes additional right of way horizontally, we're both gonna, those both are gonna get to the same answer of lowering your congestion, but we, uh, you know, could potentially put more stock in one versus the other based on our opinion from the people that live here. So your your opinion is not going to sway my traffic professional opinion on what work will work or will not work for the corridor. But when we come down to it, and if, you know, there are two alternatives that look different characteristically, but function about the same, then that's where this input is valuable to an outsider, your independent reviewer, to try and opine as to what might be better for your community instead of just coming in here with, uh, this is my idea, we didn't really consult anybody, and what we think. If I might, it, it, I think it's, it's where we balance 
the environment mitigation impact to the stony area versus the solution that are you know the, the four different ones you know how does it how does it go with one the community um and then our desires to to make certain the traffic is moving well but not really impact you know over impacting the area so i, I think that's kind of the area in, in question that we need to answer but sean you've got a comment yeah, yeah sir if you uh, thanks for indulging me um so the four alternatives that kate uh had mentioned there'll be a um a assessment of the no build right the current scenario is a baseline to really understand what happens if you don't do anything in the corridor there'll be an assessment of what we um what the county and um the dot have come up with a modified preferred so we know again how to compare that to it um the mayor makes a good point we're trying to understand a balance so they're without looking at the alternatives on the screen that were already evaluated um, as Kate mentioned, there's types of alternatives. There's alternatives that have a completely different alignment that have much much more significant environmental impact. If that is not a desire of the committee to uh, to, to advance those, then Lock Mueller can take those off their list and say we're not going to have um, alternatives that that double, triple, quadruple, or or have a significantly more environmental impacts. There are alternatives. If you look at the the current corridor and some uh, alignments uh, through there, there are some that have significantly more impact to the Stony community and the traditional cultural property. If the committee doesn't want to have um, significantly more impact to that um, to that community, then it, again, it's a balance um, that they're trying to understand and. It's doing a good job to say, here's kind of the criteria that you would look at. And with that, they can then go forward and say, we've now filtered the alternatives that, that have been evaluated and others that we may come up with and come down to a narrower list that we believe we should then advance into this modeling sim simulation. There will be, once the al four alternatives are selected, intersection options within each, each of those alternatives that are evaluated in the modeling to understand um, grade separation and different types of you know cloverleaf jug handle whatever um, I'm I'm not the guy to to get into the technical part but that'll be part of the next step to understand the actual intersection opportunities within those alignments. I, I think a fair question would you know to the committee would be do you want to see overpasses? Yeah. See overpasses. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, if that's if that's the direction then what's the impact, right? Not only, well, across the, the whole area, right? What what is that impact? What does it mean? And and, I, and, I, and it's tough to make that decision to your point without actually seeing it. What does it mean? And and what is that mitigation? You know, how does it impact that whole area? Um, and, and just having a discussion on it, um, I don't think gets us to the point where we can make a true decision on that. So. No, I, I agree, man. That that you have to see that in a simulation. I mean, that's a powerful instrument. It's a simulation. And I think um, great that you will sort of give an overview of all the alternatives and what's possible, what's not, and timing. And um, the other thing I wanted to say is that I want to be very careful with the population growth um, because it's a bit of a crystal ball. Um, you mentioned the 60,000 uh, for Jasper and Beaufort. Uh, why, I would like to have that understood by uh, by everyone what does that mean where does that number come from how do you argue that that's one and secondly if you come with a base growth number um do um variations on that number so we can see okay let's say if we do have a one percent growth over uh, a year how does how does that reflect into the, the traffic scene or if you have a half percent and why because i think those are fundamental numbers that and change it drastically. I agree. The growth rate is a very important point, which is why we're taking our time to make sure we get that right. And I don't want to get hung up on the 60,000 number necessarily. Um, the, the point of showing that is our investigation per the scope of the travel demand model, where the previous growth estimates were coming from. Um, our determination is that there are enough missing pieces in that model that we don't feel confident in that alone. 
And so the 60,000 was just one of the examples of why we don't feel super confident in that model for this specific instance, not to say that that model is not valid or useful or correct for other applications. But those are a few of the reasons why we don't feel it's what we would prefer to use in, in this instance. And so we do not yet have a growth rate that we, our minds even are considering because we still have to go through the process of, okay, we cannot use model. We don't feel it's appropriate in this setting to use the model. So what should we do instead? That was the, the second bulleted point that Shreve had on his slides. We're gonna try and do our own quick model equation based with a lot of other different data from, from the island. And we are still in the process of collecting that data. So in the, in the timeline of how this entire project is gonna go, we need to feel confident in a growth rate and decide on that before we are truly able to definitively model these four alternatives that you know I'm talking about now. So yes, it would be great to have you know kind of mod working models of of each of these alternatives to aid in this discussion. That'll be part of a future meeting. We're not at that step today to do that. Um, I agree that it is a useful visualization tool, and there are lots of in intricacies to it, but that's not where we are today. We have to collect additional data to agree upon that growth rate, and that really is the, the crux of any of our future modeling efforts, because a lot of these alternatives that I have described, um, you know, the different kinds of alternatives that I have described, some of them, quite frankly, don't work if you have a very high left turn volume. Um, you know, some of them work better if you don't have a lot of side street traffic that's trying to get into the main line and the growth rate very significantly impacts those future volumes. And so that growth rate may in and of itself take some of these alternatives off the table. Um, you know, the traffic is too high in that area to consider a regular signal, even if it does have the left turns, you know, pulled out to treat differently, we may um, kind of be directed naturally by the volumes to look at grade separation in some areas. And that is, why I, I think it's valuable to have the discussion on on preferences here. Um, you know, if there was a very, very strong opposition to overpasses or bridges, but the numbers naturally led us there, um, you know, that would be a, a consideration. Um, you know, we, we really would try to find every other creative alternative to still achieve the task at hand for us, which is to improve your congestion and reduce your delay along this corridor. Uh, but it also may not be possible. And so that, again, is going to build our report and build the, the case that we make for why we feel that these alternatives are the best ones for the corridor. Um, you know, if uh, there was very, very strong opposition to overpasses and that seems to be the only thing that really would fix fix a specific area based on the growth rate, based on the future volumes, then that's going to help us to feel confident coming like this is our professional opinion, you know, like, and I hope that that would uh, give everybody confidence that we have not done this in a vacuum. And that really is, you know, kind of that's, that's the answer. So that's, that's the point of this dialogue and the collaboration. Um, you know, we're not here to have you pick the alternatives. I'm not here to have anybody sway our professional engineering opinion, but this information and the comments, um, you know, I, I want everybody to know that, like, I hear you, we hear you, and these are noted through the process. <clears throat> Two things, I, you know, I, I think you you, you, you talked about U-turns and, and one of those options, which was a highly negative conversation a couple of years ago and was not something that was eagerly wanted to be pursued. Um, you know, so, so could that be just wiped off immediately and not look at those Michigan U-turns or, or whatever you're calling them? But but I think also the the challenge for us is you're we're talking about four options for a, a long corridor while one may be better somewhere else. You know, and I understand you're trying to say what what would be open what would we be open to? But as we look at it as an entirety, trying to picture those different things down that corridor to make a decision as to what might be best or not may be a little difficult or premature at this time. Uh, yes, having specific alternative alignments decided in this meeting, um, you know, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
ever the intent, obviously, um, you know, we need a lot more information to be to be gathered uh, for that. But to, to your point, you know, this is a very long corridor. Um, there are still rules of thumb that we certainly are going to follow um, for corridor continuity and driver expectation and how it feels to drive the corridor. We don't want to be bringing people up and down and up and down and, you know, you have to U-turn here, but not here and then here. Um, you know, we, we will do our best to make it a, a seamless and comprehensive corridor for not only the people that live here to travel, but visitors, um, you know, visitors that come to the island aren't going to know where things are necessarily. And so if we, um, you know, have a U-turn here and then you have to go to a flyover there and, you know, we, we want it to be a pleasurable experience for visitors to the island too, and not just people that know that you have to take that ramp to get over across the street every day. So we are going to do our best to try and find solutions in the alternatives that we analyze in the future that will accommodate all of those things. I think one thing that probably is kind of evident, but it needs to be stated, I think is, I think right away takings need to be kept to a minimum, period, right? Especially through the stony area. So, yeah, I would think any right away, really, keep keep everything to a minimum because it's the less less is the uh, environmental impact of it. So I think that's one thing, but I think it, it needs to be stated. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you. Um, so what I've heard, what I understand so far from our conversation, not to say that it's over, we can add more points. I just want to you know to kind of do a check in. Our okay with seeing overpasses and even think that it has to be part of the part of the equation U turns no don't you turn people and right away takings need to be kept to a minimum if at all possible um maybe perhaps hold that firm in the stony community and if we did have to take a little bit minimize it for the rest right. of the corridor i think it needs to be viewed as, as a minimization absolutely Personally, I would prefer not to see any overpasses, but I know that may not be a solution, but personally, I wouldn't prefer that. And Mr. Chairman, if I could jump in, um, you know, the way that the scope was set up to, to go down to these four alternatives, um, and I'll have Nate and Kate um, correct me if I'm wrong, they're really the alignments, right? When we get down into evaluation of intersection treatments, They'll be based on what the committee and, and Lock Mueller come up with, what they think are reasonable alignments. And we talked about the no build, we talked about the current modified preferred, and a couple others. And so when we talked about this evaluation, I, and I cheated a little bit on the agenda, as part of the scope, it said they're, they're going to look at throughput and traffic simulation for these alignments. They're going to look at cost and their just order of magnitude. Um, and then also safety, environmental, and community impacts should be taken into account. So these are not, you know, not the only factors that could be considered, but in the scope, it said these things would be part of the evaluation. So, you know, the committee, and it sounds like, Charlie, you made the comment, the community impacts, right, minimizing the takings or additional right-of-way need is important to, when you look at the alternatives. Now, Lock Mueller has some confidence to go back and say, these alternatives, which had um, additional right of way or community impact, um, th then we feel comfortable now not advancing those. And so, yeah, I think that's exactly what they they need from feedback from the committee. Any other comments? Uh, comments. I also think it's important to um, look when you make these restrictions in the traffic coming onto the main line to take into consideration the peak hours. So these restrictions, um, if, you, if you turn off a light for people to go onto the main line or turn off um, left turns only between certain hours. Yeah? So, and what, in, in your simulation model, how does it affect the, the flow of traffic overall? There would be compliance with something like that. You think there would be compliance with a policy like that where you have left turns that are allowed during the peak hours but or not during the peak hours but then allowed at other times of the day because you can't 
pick up the turn lane and take it away during the peak hour and put it back when you want people to be able to turn, it's going to be signage that says you can't do that, but the pavement will still be there. Do you think this community would comply with that? Yeah, but I mean, turn off the left turn by having a gate, just like they do on some of the, the high speed toll roads. So they block them off. They're, you know, northbound in the morning into a city and southbound in the evening, and they have gates that come down. Look at doing the same thing. You you know, if, if it's the morning, it's uh, it's open from midnight to noon, and then that gate comes down, and then after that, you have no left turns the rest of the day. Those are options that I think we need to. If you, that's the beauty of the, the, the synchro gurus, uh, which you are, you know, uh, put that into the model, see what happens. I mean, and, uh, you know, what kind of effect does it have? Is it significant enough to say, okay, uh, we need to look into this further or um, not worth it? I mean, that's. Well, so so that point, I want to, I know there are other people that, uh, you know, want to jump in. I want to speak to that very specifically, you know, putting stuff into the model. Yes, we are able to do that. Every model run that we do takes a lot of time and our time equals calendar time and then budget essentially, um, you know, tax paying dollars that are paying for this study. So I, I, that's why we want to be so judicious about picking what we are gonna put into the model so that we don't spend our time looking at something that, um, you know, is just kind of this offhand idea that other ideas had maybe more merit, and then we've we've wasted calendar and budget time looking at some of those. I things. think it's worth the time, and it, once you have a base model lined up, it doesn't take that much. I mean, I've looked at uh, various BISM and Synchro and InfraWorks, all these models. To 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 modify it doesn't take uh, too much time. I think in Synchro, perhaps not. Depending on the modification, BISM takes a substantial more. A substantially higher amount of of time to to do some of those things. Probably worth it. Hear you. Um, our scope is that we have four alternatives to to look at, and we can squeeze as much as we can into that as possible. But we also um, need to be judicious to the contract that we've entered into with the town. So we, I'm looking at the scope. So alternative. Settle on the four alternatives. There'll be um, uh, simulations run in the model. Synchro is a quicker, I think, right? Um, model capability that can look at alter uh, intersection alternatives. We'll evaluate whatever we need, right? If we need to modify and add a couple more, if it takes a little longer, we'll do that. Um, so but we have that, and it's looking at peak hour, just like you mentioned. So I'm confident that the scope of work will get us the answers we need, provided the assumptions that they need to then narrow this down for evaluation are supported. And um, if we can narrow down the, the alignment alternatives and then go deeper as we are very close to being able to share growth rate or ranges that they believe are comfortable with what Sharif had mentioned, and then look at the um, treatment intersections and all of that for modeling that we can go there. Yes, yes. Our intent for future meetings is that we, you know, once we have a growth rate established, agreed upon, um, you know, I fully intend to come with ideas to, you know, future meetings, uh, perhaps more than four, uh, you know, so that we can, you know, I like this one better than that one, you know, like, please move forward with these four alternatives and we will have vetted them previously in, in synchro, um, you know, we can tinker around with some different options, turning on and off some things, um, but then we will, we'll have another touch point whenever another potential for conversation before we officially nail down the four alternatives um, for your for your consideration forward within the scope. Um, because I, I, I would think you've got to keep the bridge in mind here. I mean, what's going to happen to the bridge? Is this based on the uh, preferred alternative? One of one of our options will look at what has already been identified as the modified preferred alternative to give us a comparison. Is what we have come up with independently better or worse than, you know, how does it compare against what, what others have done? So we will look at that as part of this process. All right, but have, are there alternatives for the 
selection of the what happens to the bridges, for example. In my view, if you want to use one of our alternatives to assume that there is additional access onto the island, then we can talk about doing that. And we would have a agreed upon percent reduction to the corridor with assumed traffic that has been rerouted to a different a different location. Um, otherwise, trying to analyze where an additional connection would come in or how or what it looks like is not the focus of what we are here doing. Lockmiller is here to try and figure out what the on the ground roadway network needs to be in the future. And if one of our alternatives in the future wants to assume that there is a second point of access onto the island, we can make an assumption. Well, along I'm not those saying lines. that. I'm not saying a second. I'm, I'm saying that the location of the preferred alternative bridge, which is to the south, I guess, of the existing bridge. Well, that's that's the preferred alternative that the county has come up with, correct? He, he's speaking to the the DOT's proposed right. bridge just going right underneath it. Are you speaking, Charles, to yes. as an alternative being evaluating rehabbing the existing bridge exactly. as an alternative? Yeah, I'm, and, I'm and uh, rehabbing one. and widening. Yes, so uh, that's what I'm looking at. Utilizing one of our alignment alternatives as as, as a way to right as opposed to keeping kind of by itself, I think it include the bridge bridges as part of it. No, that's why I've asked. In other words, is this based on the preferred alternative, which the county and DOT have agreed on, supposedly? Um, or, is, or are you looking at the bridge as a way to, like I said, either widen it or do something different? I think that one of all, yeah, Sean. If you don't mind, I'll jump in. So I think part of the um, alternative analysis of the modified preferred alternative um, should include an order of magnitude cost for a, a replacement of a new bridge as proposed versus the rehab of the existing bridge and potential widening. I think understanding the delta in cost and time frame for construction are certainly information that needs to be known. We're not even at that point. Uh, determining cost yet. I mean, the, the, it has been developed by the county, I guess, of what the cost is or is going to be. But I'm, 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 I don't not, I'm not necessarily in agreement with that. With with what it, with that they projected. Oh we, well, I'm, and I'm not saying what they've come up with. At, at this point, when we look at um, cost difference in cost, it should be order of magnitude, right? And sure. so we should have that information when we make a dis when we um, are considering the alternative for recommendation. Sure. Any other comments? Have you gotten direction, proper direction from us? Yes. Yes. We are okay. Generally, okay with seeing overpasses. Um, you know, some feel it's a must. Some maybe wouldn't prefer it. U turns, no. Right away taking is kept to a minimum. My understanding and definitely something that I can work with. Thank you for the discussion. Okay. Um, well, on, on your time frame for modeling, I think you started to say you're close, but I think there's a lot of folks that really want to see the modeling and simulation. So um we know we have to do the quick update to the travel demand model to give some confidence on output um, and then show and ultimately this sim modeling um, being able to see some of this yeah yeah i can detail the steps again for you know where we are and where we're going to go so this week we are collecting site data both at specific intersection locations and as tyson mentioned earlier he is driving the corridor to try and better understand the adaptive signal modeling system that was just implemented. That's that's one piece of you know existing data that we have in the works. We also are in the process of acquiring that additional 
growth related data such as um, you know accommodation tax parking revenue new building permits those types of things that are going to help us come up with the quick model to estimate a growth rate in lieu of being able to use the travel demand model or having confidence in the previously provided data um, you know we, we may end up in about the same spot I'm not saying that it it might not end there but we we would like to go through the separate effort to have either confirmation that that number is still good or if we find something else we will have confidence in the process that got us to that point so we still need to arrive at a future growth rate once we have our data from this week collected we will be able to go back and finish the existing conditions models the next step after existing conditions models is a future no build what would this network and traffic on the island look like in the future years 2045 if we didn't do any roadway improvements generally obviously everyone's going to uh, assume it's going to look worse a lot worse with more traffic and no improvements but that's an important part of the process to then compare any future improvements by you know that's that's the new measuring point that's no longer existing that we measure improvements by we measure them by the future no build before we're able to do that we have to come to consensus on the growth rate so we will need to have additional data go through the process of making that quick model um, you know our equation based analysis and come up with a number that we feel good about that will then have to go into the no build models after that point where we are able to then start altering the no build models into configurations that we perceive will help in the future and those are the future alternatives that everybody's itching to get to and i am i am too Is that it for your presentation for today? Okay. So now we'll move on to appearance by citizens. Baird. Much Stephen Bear and to go run. Very impressive technical presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, a few quick points. When you talk about demand, you must use peak demand, not average demand. If you analyze our network right now, there's plenty of average capacity to 2045. Problem is peak. Mainly workers, but also tourists on Sundays and sa Saturdays. Second point, I agree uh, with the right away uh, issues, but there are many options that may use a little bit more right of way, but reduce traffic congestion tremendously, such as the overpasses and underpasses and also the bypasses. Also want to remind you there's a huge quantity of town owned land in the area of interest and the town has maps on that. And the last point to take to Mr. Walzak's comment, there are options to slightly reduce the bridge size. It's about 20% too large, considering it's 11 lanes right now. If you reduce it to eight or nine lanes, you don't affect the traffic capacity much, but the bridge is cheaper, has less environmental impact, doesn't require the 40 acres of wetlands it does right now, uh, and still carries the same amount of traffic. So consider that if you use more environmental impact a little bit, uh, on bypasses or overpasses, you can save some on chopping some of those extra lanes off the bridge and still have six lanes of traffic capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Joseph Kern at 48 Hearthwood Drive. <clears throat> I don't like this timing thing. We have a lot more to say. And because it's a problem, I have sent a letter, which you may have seen or not, to these. Uh, to the contractor to explain uh, a lot more about what our all overall issue is here with the congestion. And basically, it's the fact that the network on of streets and um, intersections on the island can, does not have enough flexibility to distribute the traffic. So when we add lanes to a single bridge that comes to the island, the additional lanes are not going to solve a thing, nothing. We have to take a look at the management of the overall situation, which includes the development of the traffic patterns before they hit the island. The morning uh, period is the worst situation, and that's the one that needs to be focused on. And I have sent you the committee a briefing material some time ago, which I then provided to these 
to our contractor, which explains that you must manage the traffic before it hits the island. The second bridge connecting the causeway uh, uh, with a causeway rather and a bridge between uh, the Bluffton Parkway and our Cross Island Parkway would provide additional paths for for organizing the traffic off island and delivering it then uh, in the mornings to, to where it needs to go. I was happy to see uh, in the earlier display that they have begun to look at um, the traffic uh, itself. What is it? When the Department of Transportation looks at traffic, it's just they don't distinguish between groups of people. We know that we have three groups. We have those of us who you represent only, those of us who pay taxes and live on this island. We also have the tourists. And we also have the off-island uh, workers who come here. The general problem we have is, as they showed earlier with some statistics, the population is growing, of uh, visitors is growing much faster than we, than we have a uh, local population. As a result, we have this problem of the congestion. If we take a look at, at a real alternative of a second bridge and causeway, uh, separate from what we have now, we will find that we won't have to do anything in the stony area. We don't need additional lanes in there. We don't have to disrupt people further. It's so important that you stand back and look at this thing. It's not just an island or a street portion of the island or a pothole or something. It includes, it includes Bluffton and the county. The traffic has to be sorted off island before it gets here. Yes, sir. My comments and uh, one question are directed uh, to the consultant, uh, if you will. Uh, you should be aware of the fact that Hilton Head, or the state rather, considers Hilton Head as a cash cow, and that the final cost of the project, no matter what it is, will not and should not prove to be a deterrent. I'm also sure uh, that you're aware of the fact that there have been at least two sham studies done by the county. And I also understand that Mayor Perry told you at the last meeting that the 11 lane soup. The Cross Island Parkway. That's what you were told at the last meeting. So my question to you is given the fact that many powerful forces are lined up against you, including the Hilton Head Chamber of Commerce, the unelected Greater Island Council, big developers, as well as the state and the county itself. My question is real simple. How can you assure the public that your study will be a truly independent study of all political considerations? Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Baby. Can, can the consultant respond? They don't respond to questions if they're doing this. Really? The most important question of all, Mayor. The most important question. You can have a conversation. How can we have a truly independent study? But in public comment, we don't re respond back. That's been a policy. That's your policy. That has been a policy. Where where is it written? What's the? It, it's in Robert's rule. Can the consultant answer? Mr. Babel. John, you want the answer? Um, um, well, my comment would be this: the committee. And town council to approve the scope of work. Committee's making sure that the consultant follows the scope of work. Um, we'd like them to do it independently. The comments that you've made have, um, are reasons we don't want to engage with the consultant outside of this room, right? Um, they should be aware of previous efforts, but not let it bias their their goal. And that's what the goal of the committee is to do. So thank you, Abel. Good morning. My name is Frank Babel, and uh, uh, I'm a bicycle and pedestrian advocate. Uh, for those who don't who, who don't know me on the committee, and that's most of you, uh, I served for 10 years as the uh, co-chair of the Bicycle Advisory Committee. Uh, we brought to you these uh, different awards 
uh, last couple of three years, I've been the chair of the Pipe Walk Hilton Head Island, which is a successful organization. Uh, I served on the Palmetto Cycling Coalition, the uh, statewide advocacy organization. I've worked with SCDOT for half a dozen years. Uh, I served on the uh, Beaufort County Bike Ped Task Force, and we have a master plan for bike ped uh, through Beaufort County and Jasper County. It's been approved by all the municipalities and the gov and the LATS and the state. I also served on the uh, original uh, uh, US 278 Corridor Committee, and I'm still, I think, a stakeholder at SCDOT. The reason I'm here, obviously, is to talk about biking. And so the question I have for you, Mr. Chairman, is this the right organization I ought to share with you the plan that SCDOT has for the bike routes, or do I belong in another place? That's my question. And I'm prepared to give you a very quick overview of what that plan is and the flaw that I think it has. What would you like to do? You've got a minute 42, keep on. Okay. Well, it's a pretty simple plan. I'll give you a copy of it. But basically, it starts in the mainland with a 10-foot pathway that goes to the marsh, then gets, becomes a 15-foot boardwalk going to the bridge, then becomes a 15-foot separate bike facility with a couple of bump outs, goes underneath the bridge, and then becomes a 10-foot pathway up to shelter, uh, up to Spanish Falls Road. That's a very good plan, except for one thing. The 10-foot pathway on the right, right next to US-278 US is a bad idea. It's a canyon. The sound in there is incredible. I invite you to go someday at rush hour and try to stand there for five minutes and listen to it. It's a terrible thing. It needs to be moved over about 100 feet into the utility easement. Okay? And that's the safest, best, lowest cost way to get that done. The second is something you're going to have to worry about, and that's the intersection of Gun Tree and the William Hilton Parkway. Crossing that William Hilton Parkway at that point is extremely dangerous. Kids were crossing all that. It needs to be a two-step uh, process. So when you look at that, really look at that and look at the people coming from Jarvis Park. Okay, That's a very important crosswalk for bikes and pedestrians. We want a lot more people to come that way. Eventually, we're going to have a pathway that's going to service uh, uh, you know, that uh, wonderful road, Spanish Wells, over there and up into the uh in, into the park and uh that's just going to put more pressure on this so i'm going to hand out to you what the plan is if, it, if you just give that to you ask okay i'll i'll give this to you thank you for your attention comments yes sir my name is christopher cliff um history is typically a poor uh, basis on which to formulate projections. But I think we've all agreed that data is critical to the recommendations uh, that your team will come up with. So I'd just like to comment upon the data that your colleague referred to. He said the census showed a population growth of 2% and that the volume of traffic in the same period was 16%. Well, I've looked at the census data. And if you look at the analysis of the census data, the critical data uh, refers to, you know, permanent residents and the age profile, the work profile. It's a, a big stretch of imagination to suggest that in 2010 to 2020, the population growth was 2%. It's nowhere near it. If you also look at the traffic volumes, and I've actually got a uh, database of traffic coming onto the island from the 1st of January 2018 uh, through to the end of October this year. And I've been back to pre-2010. And one thing that stands out about the SCDO data is how unreliable it is. The number of months in which in any one year there's gaps of many days. It happened again this year, despite them installing new data in November 2018. And the amount of data that's missing has quite an impact on the data. So I'd suggest to you the growth in traffic in 2010, 2020 is substantially greater than 
And you've also got to factor in Hurricane Matthew, which had a major impact on the data of traffic. You've also got to factor in COVID. Uh, from April 2020, it almost became a standstill. OK, so the data that you're looking at, uh, historical data, I think you need to look at very closely. And I think you'll find there's a gross underestimation of the impact of uh, temporal data, temporal traffic, visitors, day visitors, and tourism. Uh, we residents are being squeezed by the ghoulies, um, and we're being set aside as if we have a little um, say in this slab of concrete that's being proposed. But nevertheless, um, you need to take into account the growth of traffic. And we need to say to ourselves, the main proponents of that growth, the hospitality industry, are the ones that are making the most noise about uh, starting building on this, this awful uh, bridge. Thank you. Another public comment. And back there. Yes, sir. Good morning, Steve Robinson and Eagle Run. I want to first start off by thanking the uh, consultants for their presentation and for the uh, unending work that uh, this committee has worked on. I'm just here to explain a couple of things that I hope are taken in consideration. That is, and one is an opinion. Um, I'll start out with that. COVID was uh, very hard on this island and yes, uh, the traffic was way down, but I'm here to say I've been living here for four years. I used to live here in 89. And there's definitely been a reduction in visitors in 2023 compared to 2022. I can tell you that right now. I mean, by, if you would just look at traffic. OK, 2022, they were backed up all the way to Sam's Club. That never happened in 2023. Well, let me get to the main fact about the presentation of census. I urge that part of the database should absolutely be the increase in census. You should in include the data from new home permits, number one. Number two, you should include the tax taxation of, of uh, residents and non-residents. Non-residents should be picked up whether they're rentals or whether they're second homes. Use an average, weighted average, whatever average you think is best for the non-home, um, uh, in other words, the rentals. If they're four flats, if they're five, they're six. That's your census, okay? Work with the vacation companies. Find out how many people come down. First of all, find out how many people don't live here who own property here. That has got to be in your formula. Um, I don't believe that we're going to have a big increase in um, in in the residents of Hilton Head Island. You know why? Because there's not that much land left. If people sell, people buy. If it's a home and it's got two people, four people, two people, four people are moving into it. So where is the increase unless you look at new home construction and permits? So I hope you're looking at that. Um, workforce, real quick. I thought I heard that uh, you're looking at receipts from restaurants or something. Those people are the ones that need to be helped actually more than anybody, even in an off season. Just go off at 7.30, 8.39, it looks like it's high season. Those people have their backlog unbelievably. So I think you need to have the restaurant industry help you real quick find out how many people they have working and, and go from there. I think these are all items that should be included in your data collection. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, no other comments? Okay. Thank you all for your comments. Seeing none, we'll come back in uh, new business. Monthly meeting dates. Do we have? Can I make one, one remark, uh, Mr. Mayor? Um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking about where we're going to end up with this study. 
and the end product. And uh, I know the county has done two studies for uh, the wrong or the right reasons. Um, I must recommend, I must commend the town for really interacting with the community and um, and bringing those community comments in. Um, and I also have to thank the the uh, consultants for uh, putting up with all our comments because um, I think it's a it's a lot of work, but it's very useful. At the end of the day, we're going to sit down with the county once we have a final product from the consultant. And we we are have we have to come to an agreement with the county on what it is that we're going to do. And for that reason, I think it's quite important that our fundamentals and our reasoning is really solid. And I think part of that is the process that we take in getting to that point. So I think it's a really good thing that we are taking that that uh, course. Um, and I have one final uh, remark, and that is that uh, the Sea Pine Circle uh, is going to be a squeeze point. Um, because the traffic circle has, has many issues. And I would encourage the consultant to also talk with our councilman, Steve Alfred, um, because I know that Sea um, Pines itself has a committee you know, all teed up that is looking at these issues, but they're not, tra they're not traffic consultants. And I think they, they do know a lot about these issues with the traffic circle, but I think uh, interacting with them would be helpful to you we incorporate that into the overall plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. I have another thing to see. Ask if the consultant has. Did you receive the uh, comments that were submitted through the uh, town through the portal? Did you receive these three letters? We'll make sure that they, they, they get them. That you didn't get them. Were they Were they dated March thirty first of twenty twenty three? Well, no, they're, they're dated. December 10th and whatever. Um, one is one is involving funding. All right, we're okay. Well, then the second was involved a second bridge, and then the other one was uh, Mr. Babel was here to talk about his bike paths and whatever. But uh, the one on funding, there was even an article in the paper uh, that I read from uh, Tom Davis. Apparently, funding is going to be out often about three months. And basically, uh, I guess it, by March, I think there has to be an agreement by March. Your your uh, and your here is going to at least go to June, July, correct? So apparently, there's a funding issue involved with this project. That apparently they're going to we're going to lose state funding. Or were you made aware of that? It, we will provide the comments that came in through the portal for information. The consultants, not, um, it's not part of their scope to worry about the, the funding, the gap for funding. Well, well I'm making it part. I mean, I'm. Yeah, we'll make them aware, but it's not part of their, will be part of their recommendation that comes to this committee. I think the question might be is the, the, the timing of, of having some of the work back to yeah, they, us. Exactly. They're, they're, they're working for us, right? right? To for the committee. March 31st. And I'm asking them to address that. If they're aware of this, they should be made aware of this so that they understand that there's funding available that's not going to be available, according to Tom Davis, our senator. No, Charlie, Tom Davis also has said that he will um, approach the DOT for it, that it's not that big of an issue. And Chrissy Hall, uh, the, the DOT secretary, has uh, assured us that she will wait for the decision of the town. So well, th th there have been obviously a lot of conversations regarding the funding aspect and um, Senator Davis has said some things. Um, Secretary Hall has said some things. So um, we've also um, there's been some communication from the from the head of the sub. Um, so there's more communication that needs to take take place for for complete clarity. Absolutely. Yes. I'll just add that Block Mueller understands that time is of the essence here, and we are committed to getting you answers as quickly as possible, but we will not compromise the quality of our study to do so, and we need sound data to move forward with the. No, I agree. I agree that it should not be compromised, but I, you should certainly be made aware of this, which. Thank you. All right, meeting dates, January. 
Um, Mr. Ma uh, Mayor, we were pr proposing a regular meeting date going forward so we can lock this in on the calendar. Um, we were looking the second Wednesday of each month um, for meeting time frame between 1 and 3 p.m. Uh, we works. had sent some information out to the committee um, and I don't know if we got unanimous responses back, but that's the time frame that we're proposing. Is everybody OK with that? No, I think I think it's good, and that way we can everybody can put it on their calendars and can show up and and push your opinions. So um, let's go ahead and get that on there. Any other discussions? Any other business? Okay, seeing none, we're adjourned. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for being here.